uh, exhibitions, but I think uh, given the limitations of time, uh, I would just say that, that one of the, the, the most important things uh, very recently has been his involvement as the artist who has occupied uh, the, uh, the Polish pavilion at the Venice Biennale uh, this year. There have been also some other recent uh, books, namely this one called Guess, which was published by Carta, and uh, recently published by Black Dog in London, City of Refuge, 9-11 uh, uh, Memorial. In this work, I think what is also um, interesting and, in, and uh, I think uh, relevant for us, and it's, it's really a certain set of ideas that I think we also um, share, so it would be interesting to see if we're going to have anything to disagree with uh, here, but I think that, that uh, what is interesting is uh, the emphasis, again, that at the level of the urban, he places on uh, a certain tradition of, of, of thinking, which is that of um, agonistic philosophy, that of, of the space of the city as, uh, as, a, as a space of, uh, of uh, acknowledging its importance as a space of disagreement uh, for the citizens. It's not simply a kind of hegemonic space of consensus of community building, and as a result of this idea of the community, when, when you have too much community, you also have exclusion, because communities define their relationship to each other by what they don't want inside the community. Uh, and I tell you, living in Cambridge, you very quickly become aware of the, the importance of, uh, of, or the degree to which this, this, this idea of neighborhood uh, and community itself can actually not be always so um, so welcoming and inclusive. So uh, despite despite all the all the wonderful people who are around. So I think I think I think that this is very interesting that, that the concept of community really through the through the urban suggests a much more diverse, a much more conflictual condition of uh, of of living. And I think so the city of refuge is at, you know in one sense kind of addresses those. But I think for us architects also in some ways as a parallel, though it's not necessarily kind of picked up in this book, parallel with, for example, the work that Ford was doing with the Salvation Army and seeing the Salvation Army project also as a kind of city, as a place of refuge for those who are homeless. Anyway, without further delay, I would like to, to welcome Christoph, who as usual will, will talk for about 20 minutes, half an hour, um, we will try to stop him once he gets to about 35 minutes, um, and uh, then we'll have a conversation. The purpose of this, as I said, is, is, is very, very informal, and the sooner we can get you to really engage him, uh, the better. So get your questions ready, don't run away, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, participate, please. Uh, please welcome Christopher. Uh, listening to you, I realized that uh, perhaps I should think of myself uh, as the very object of my work, the monument. <laughs> uh, but I sympathize with monuments, not only uh, project critical light on them, because um, here they are speechless. And I'm a little also speechless because I cannot disagree with anything you said. Uh, I cannot um, even look at my own notes without seeing your words somewhere <laughs> written there <laughs> and underlined the uh, uh, ideas. So um, I might uh, say a few things, but uh, it may be very similar to what you said. But maybe it's my voice, my kind of, uh, emotional charge. It will <laughs> always, sound, will always like, sound better. Yes, not better, but different. Uh, uh, well, it's clear that the city is very close to my heart. And I've uh, been uh, always living in very crowded, intense urban environments my entire life. And I'm old enough, I live in many different cities. And the city, of course, uh, historically is the major hope 
for those who are estranged, strangers, the excluded, the marginalized. Uh, it is definitely the very uh, stage and the very stake of democratic process. And it, it, despite all of its great uh, promises, it is seem to be always not doing enough. It's, uh, it's always uh, to come. Avenir, as Derrida uh, used to say, a city to come, uh, like as democracy, something to come. So it needs uh, yet another effort, as, as he, uh, he would say, once more effort. I'm calling it all. And in this way, uh, uh, we all kind of participating in this process. If uh, of making it uh, still one more effort. Uh, so the question is that uh, this effort requires uh, all sorts of uh, co collaboration between, I don't know, many different uh, parties and people. Uh, it requires political passion, freedom to express one's own views, the right to disagree, the sense to protest, protest. Oh, the story. It's uh, to remember, to be a witness to something that went wrong in order to propose or manifest a disagreement with it in hope uh, to, to reach a better, uh, better world, to build a better world. So, testimony, monument, moneo, warning. The monument also is not only there to remember, to commemorate, but also to give us a warning, a memento. Beware that it might happen again. So do something to animate this frozen structure with some uh, uh, both uh, image of the monument as a witness, but also as uh, uh, oneself who is a witness, as being oneself, ourselves, a witness who uh, also should uh, animate oneself to animate democratic process. So there is uh, those uh, uh, thoughts, loose thoughts, that um, I want to share immediately. Uh, the political character and totality of Athens, world Levinas, and the ethical and anarchic individualism of Jerusalem are equally indispensable in order to suppress violence and secure the democratic process. So the city must be always delegitimizing itself as democracy itself for all of those people who are excluded from the process and question one's own uh, legitimacy and uh, should not take for granted anything, should see city, should see uh, uh, should see itself from the point of view or through the wounds and, and pain of those of uh, whom no one wants to know anything, <coughs> no one wants to hear. The city must listen to its own silences, so to speak. Because the speech of the city, as somebody else pointed out, is also uh, the silence of the city. It's the way what the what city doesn't talk about. Well, that is the, this is what you uh, pointed out so uh, clearly already. Also. So that takes into account all of those who are in its ruins, abandoned buildings, in its shelters, the illegal residents, immigrants, the traumatized returning soldiers from foreign wars, the painful affected families, the abused people, excluded, those who work in sweatshops and the survivors, victims of contemporary slavery, slave traffic, domestic, commercial, and industrial abuse. So this is a kind of, uh, it, to transmit this kind of city to the city of the victors, as Benjamin would say, meaning the city of the vanquished, project onto the city of the victors. Uh, might be an important task, but it has to be undertaken by those who know the best, who know the most, who are those present-day parasiastics, 
you know, the fielders or free speakers, the core of democratic process in ancient Greece, or cynics, those who take an ethical position and, and, and call authorities uh, to be accountable for what they don't do. A scandalous behavior of cynics is, has a profound ethical uh, depth. Uh, so, uh, of course, the homeless people, the immigrants, the, the, all of those who are gathering in public spaces because they have no other place to go, they are the kind of functional cynics. So, they, they, they're not aware that they function this way. But the issue is how to make them uh, uh, intentional rather than unintentional cynics. How to help them. How to equip them. How to create conditions under which they will redevelop their lost capacities to open up, share, and transmit their experience as those uh, fearless speakers, parasiastics of today. This is the process. So the projects that, uh, of course, I'd be talking about my own projects. Uh, but I, I'm doing this in hope that uh, some of you, hopefully many of you, will develop their own projects that are very different than mine, and perhaps moving a step further, or a few steps further, what I have done uh, during uh, the years since 1969. It's been 40 years. I want to even say how many years of uh, various attempts of those uh, attempts to help the city to, to come, to become a venue, <laughs> the venue, a better city. So, sure, so uh, uh, please uh, listen to what I'm saying, but don't believe in this. Don't take it as a kind of blueprint. But, uh, you know, rather than critically uh, uh, respond to this, maybe. So, uh, saying this, <coughs> clearly that the project uh, is not only political, uh, legal, cultural, the city is also an artistic project, and also it's psychotherapeutic project, since it is impossible for those who are, are silent, of whom no one wants to hear, to simply speak once you give them a microphone. Because the very experiences they should be sharing as those first uh, potential, most important parasiastes, the very experiences are making them incapacitated often. Often they, they, their throat is, 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 uh, is tied. They cannot open up. They are often traumatized by those things they should be saying. So create a transitional, transitory, potential space, of taking care of the process in which they can uh, undo the damage and re, uh, recreate themselves as speakers could be part of artistic project. Uh, so uh, this, the reason I am uh, referring to 1969, because I belong to the very uh, special uh, kind of uh, dying or declining uh, uh, population of people who remember uh, authoritarian conditions of life under communist rule uh, in Eastern Europe. I mean, there are still some of those places, but less and less so, fortunately. Uh, but this, I am coming from the place of undemocracy. And my journey uh, through all those years is a journey in search for this democracy. And of course, first I thought I would find this democracy somewhere. You know? Since I don't have it where I am, it will be somewhere else. It was a major mistake. It took me not a very long time, but a big, lots of disappointments to realize that democracy does not exist as such. That it is being, has to be made every time you do something or insert some voice or help others to do so, who in turn will help yet other people to uh, disseminate their voice, uh, unheard voice, and enlarge in the, this process the issue of rights for uh, 
in the name of right to rights, as Hannah would say. So, yes, this is my beginning. Instrument, personal instrument, 1969. It was very personal because it needed to be very personal. I had no choice. We had no possibility to speak, period. And it was, we, in other words, we were not, uh, we were unsaved, we were not saved. We were listening to what was said. <coughs> so, if that's the case, uh, uh, in 1969, uh, I realized I could maybe design an instrument to help people to listen more. So that's all what, uh, all myself, that's all what we are supposed to be doing, then why not, uh, why not, uh, make an art of this. In fact, that's what we were doing anyway. Everybody was reading between the lines all the time. So the listening device, as a public act, act of public speech, that was, so this is the silence of the city. It's, uh, uh, and it's, 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 it's the silence of a, so, of, of, a, of a resident or citizen, or so-called citizen. The member of urban community who cannot say anything. However, it is equipped with microphone in the forehead and in two kind of spheric structures around the, his ears. There are headphones, but also electroacoustic filters and power supply, which is activated by the movement of hands in relation to the light and one's own, uh, of course, body is also making ears very important. So it's a performative instrument that, that, that develops virtuosity on the part of operator in, in fo formulating, creating own sounds, uh, like navigating through the space. So this is a kind of negative uh, public speech art project. It's a kind of... Uh, of course, uh, without sense of humor, very hard to, uh, uh, to deal with projects like this, as much as with the life under those conditions. <laughs> so <laughs> so the, anyway, you can see here a very simple diagram, how it worked. And uh, there's, some, there's some text, it's original text written in 1969. Uh, it's very veiled language. There was a time when we were allowed, encouraged to expand. As long as nothing changed, encouraged to expand and search for new means of expression, new technologies. McLuhan was a technocratic situation. So it's also a capitalizing unit of the technocratic period of late communism. So I can see uh, a Listen to things uh, uh, <coughs> with the hands, also with the with the with the body gestures. So a, a few years ago, uh, we reconstructed this instrument in Warsaw on occasion of my exhibition there, uh, replacing those uh, ancient uh, transistors. <laughs> <laughs> and also sensors, uh, photo receivers, they were called in 1969. Uh, a few electroacoustic filters just became so small. So we hope it was a very interesting experience. But anyway, that was, uh, that was the students of the industrial design department who uh, were testing it. <laughs> Uh, it's just a new object of museology right now. This, uh, this 
this kind of uh, uh, complete uh, complete uh, deprivation of rights of speech. And, uh, kind of. But uh, in uh, this doesn't mean that, uh, as I mentioned before, that I found this democracy. Uh, uh, because when I was in Japan, this is 1991, uh, I decided to, uh, mm, to focus on the situation of high school students, uh, who are the, maybe the most frustrating population in Japan, because they are from more relatively protected and, and kind environment of school, they're moving into this vicious uh, competitive, extremely black and white world of, uh, of success of, or complete failure. And they also, don't have, no one wants to listen to them. Parents have no problems, schools, colleagues. It's just complete alienation, isolation, frustration. If there's going to be any revolution, revolt, as it's called, in Japan, it will be done by high school students, not by university students, because it's too late for the university they are already trapped. So, but, but at the same time, it's impossible to speak face to face in Japan, or very hard, especially between uh, across the generational you know, divide. So um, I heard that there's some, especially in Japan, it is better to understand the person when one is looking at the person's back rather than the face. It's nice. So I, I decided to, uh, uh, to design the equipment that will allow those people uh, to become a kind of citizen, uh, meaning uh, speakers, those parasiastas. <laughs> uh, uh, in, uh, but uh, that second speech looks through their backs, so you can see uh, that there's a, a television cameras pointed at the eyes, of the operator and the monitors that project in real time those eyes and also microphone and speaker, but also there is a computer with, in which one can pre-record all of the answers uh, or provoke questions or initiate conversation in advance. So I could prepare for a year or two or something. And say all those things that is always when too late, when it's too late realizing what I'm supposed to. Uh, so, uh, also, one could uh, imagine that one person could carry another person's eyes and voice through wireless transmission by a little Of course, there were other uh, sketches that I made, very various variants, all of which was developed at MIT, the, the Interrogative Design Group, as, uh, that's the name of the group, it was my uh, colleagues, graduate students, and some. Uh, uh, students, and also with the help of school psychologists in Hiroshima and expert on school refusers at Tokyo University, psychoanalysts, they actually trained here in the Institute. Uh, so he also operated as a translator. ザーマンスイッチをオンします。夜中にあるので、私はあなたを見ます。夜中にあるスイカであなたと話します。私は今ラジオを見ています。私は今ラジオを見ています。私はあなたを見たくないときは目を閉じます。そしてミスターマンの気持ちをします。<笑><笑><笑><笑> <laughs> so the, uh, the point here is that uh, <coughs> this 
there would be no communication is impossible really without some kind of special device here. So honestly, my uh, role here, uh, as I understand, is to, uh, to explain that uh, we need to design something uh, in between the built environment and humans so they can uh, uh, also appropriate those environments in a creative way to communicate with each other, to break those walls of misunderstandings, or to communicate in space in between uh, whatever is built. So in fact, design uh, in art, public art, if we can still use this that term, is somehow interconnected with urban uh, with urban design, urban planning, with discussions that uh, we hear among urban geographers uh, to witness the development of the city, as they used to call it, uneven development. And also with uh, uh, social psychologists who work with conflict. Those who work with conflict uh, uh, transformation, not conflict resolution, not conflict management, conflict transformation. Without conflict, there's no life. So it's clear it's issue to how to create good conflicts uh, in order to avoid all the bloody confrontations that uh, uh, actually start waiting around the corner in, you know, in every pocket, especially among minorities and groups that are excluded. Those groups will possibly confront each other in search of competing for limited resources. So it's important to see cultural projects as something in between the alienated people in the city. So this uh, bring the built environment here to this short presentation. Uh, in 2001, uh, I was asked to, uh, to do something uh, to be part of the festival, border festival in Tijuana, uh, San Diego. San Diego project. Uh, so I realized that uh, the border is being crossed already on that side of the border, the Mexican side of the border already. That is, that by those young people uh, who are uh, working in maquiladora factories, the assembly lines, uh, that employ very young people, usually teenage girls, from all over Mexico and South America. They assemble things that arrive from various markets, and so they are sent back to original markets. Probably, uh, you know, this equipment, this equipment, projector, those things we have here, probably assembled in Tijuana by uh, very young people. So, in the center of Tijuana, there is this uh, building called El Centro Cultural. It's a, it's a strange object, and in fact, you see, it's very big. You can tell because there's a person there standing. So it's a combination of a modern, a modern kind of icon, uh, probably inspired by Duret, and also uh, something that wants to look like a, a Maya goddess. We so I mean a boss from central government who runs, uh, advances modernity. <laughs> it's a gift from central government. And I think, mean, of course, recognizing the regional, but there was never Mayas in that area. But anyway. That's how it is. So it's waiting for some kind of projection, right? It's waiting. <laughs> it actually is already probably an object of, of our mental projections because we always project things on the structures that are bodily metaphors from the beginning. So uh, uh, why not project something on those projections? Again and again and again. So, but that, but what project is not the real issues. Who should be projecting oneself through that structure and how it could be made? That's the issue. So why not those Maquiladora workers who already are forming a kind of group in Tijuana called Factorekis, they help themselves to survive mostly domestic abuse and abuse the work workplace. Uh, so they form a kind of informal post-traumatic stress self-help therapy group. What is officially known as something else. So uh, that I designed, designed this issue, interface design this issue. Because we have to then create interest between those people and this building, right, and us. So well, this is a kind of wearable as it used to be. Oh, I like wearable. 
wearable television station. So that with which people would get used to over a seven month period recording things in studios. And, and that it is designed in such way so the face will always uh, fit the facade. Face, facade, surface, same kind of words. To animate the face of the building, the faceless face building. With, so this is kind of same, again, design my colleagues and myself, the organ design group, extremely primitive this simple equipment. It's our bricolage of various technologies. Uh, uh, to be, uh, to fit uh, with some counter weight, so uh, kind of, that only looks difficult, but not actually possible. <coughs> so one, one space illuminated in order to be uh, 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 transmitted in real time onto the facade, so you have two faces, but also there's a pre-recorded material. So there's a mixture of pre-recorded testimonies and uh, an intervention at half speech done by those uh, women. So it was so complicated. We have pre-recorded, we have two, uh, two equipments like that. One person was preparing, another person was using, and in time we're also projecting pre-recorded material. It was also a live uh, 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 translation and inter interpretation complicated media project, extremely complicated media project. Not very complicated technology, but as a project. Important, because once you make a media project, uh, the media will come. Television, radio, so it was all transmitted, retransmitted to normal channels. So it's a very, it, it, very, a very fresh uh, situation in every respect. So the, 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 the architecture parlant as an old concept you know, assumes very different, different meaning. So inside of this building, there is IMAX theater. It's a major cultural institution. Uh, there are some museums and other places. Uh, so just a few seconds of the video, because we have time to show more. Uh, we'll show you the, the interior of such structure. It contains IMAX theater, can also be connected to the exterior. Because during the time of projection, the program inside ended, and lots of people from inside came outside. And inside those kind of propaganda, uh, audiovisual uh, spectacles, showing a glorious relationship between people of Mexico and people of the United States. Y a ella la subieron a un policía la agarró este, y la subió a, a la patrulla. Entonces después se subió el otro el que, el que, mani, el que iba manejando la patrulla. So just so you could y, see este, uh, how the in, interior of us joined the exterior of us. Y vivimos ahí tirado en el piso todo, todo, todo sangrado. Y, este, y, 
So this is just to indicate that there's a complicated issue here that we don't have time to elaborate. It's the social relations of reception of projects like this in public space. Uh, because people are meeting each other who normally are facing this project together, even if they are very much divided. So there's some Brechtian kind of uh, aspect there in terms of the, uh, the, the, the uh, crossing a social strata among the public. There are also people there who are were not invited, which is there because they were and they're passing by. So, 2008 uh, project, uh, which uh, also is now has a different version, variant here with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, Robert, and, uh, the uh, research assistant design group, we are bracing ourselves for a trip to Liverpool to continue this project with British war veterans there. Uh, the project is based on, uh, uh, on testimonies being recorded, pre-recorded and maybe even in, in, in we are lucky, maybe in real time projected uh, words of those soldiers uh, that will be blasted onto uh, the deaf walls and blank facades of the city uh, to really uh, turn the city into, into continuation of the battle. It's a continuation of war for veterans, a return from war. But it's a different war. It's a war against the wall that separates those who know what war is and those who don't. And that also affects their families. So we actually are lucky to be expanding this project at least a bit to include uh, families of veterans. They are also war veterans because they survive veterans. So this uh, means that this vehicle is not really the project uh, to gaze at and be, and be very kind of serious about uh, every, every detail <laughs> as, as the end in itself. <laughs> But rather, it's an equipment actually not that well designed because I'm not very happy with its design. So working on a different version be better. What it is that the, the, the part that is usually used of those vehicles to as a kind of a missile launcher in like a, a projectile battle station is here replaced by the projection battle. So rather than uh, pro uh, projecting projectors, project the words, project a kind of truth telling, as uh, most Foucault would say, and maybe Juliet Herman, the psychoanalyst, uses the same terminology truth telling, uh, public testimony, uh, kind of weapon. So, uh, so of course, I, this was designed very quickly, and I'm sorry, as an industrial designer, I'm not very satisfied with the details of this design. It could be more, you know, it's great. It's quick. But anyway, it contains very powerful video projector and uh, both foreign speakers, and can rotate and position itself against various uh, as, uh, two. Uh, the Cherokee House here. They identify with this, and they, uh, you know, they know that it's some of the so emotional and mental disorders associated with lots combat, of contact the with in the military, um, and then getting out and trying to get on with their lives it comes, it comes very difficult. We've known each other for what, for what, seven years, and now I've come back and I'm on welfare. Welfare. Glitch here. They put it on welfare. So there are also the things that, uh, which we don't know. And, uh, it's not only the issue of, uh, of, of complaining, but also of, uh, find, of using this project to communicate sometimes to members of the family. So that's probably could, it might be easier to communicate something to your son whom you didn't see for uh, eight years because you left the family to protect him against yourself. It's easier to reestablish contact with this strange machine 
and was also a broadcaster of National Public Radio, the fragment of those statements because they covered this. And then actually this town hall. So the, the organizer of this, uh, this project said, oh, we have to make it public because the sound call, meaning the project works. My response, keep it quiet. They resolve one problem. In order to deal with eight these new problems for the next five years, they may be now in depression after this. They are preparing themselves for new battle to actually figure out what to tell each other, you know, and how to communicate. Uh, so, so uh, yes, we didn't say anything to anybody. I can tell you, but without a uh, name or anything. So this is designed for a night, of course, projection. We have a little problem here because those projects are meant to be night projects, but we are doing this during the day, so there is some problem. Uh, the light is maybe not dark enough. The, uh, all the details of some of those projects. So the, it's important that uh, it hopefully will work. About how it's there. This yeah. is how it looks. The he said, well, come now. I had to fix me first. In order to fix me, I had to do something I never did in years. I had to go ask for help. <laughs> something years and I've come back and I'm on welfare. Nobody told me. Now the sound that is actually it's very different than here. Applied for disability in 83. There is additional didn't receive disability until 276 months later. January 10, 2005. Long process. Before you enlist, talk to a veteran. Because I guarantee you, if these kids only are exposed to what the recruiters tell them, they have zero idea of what they're really getting into. They absolutely have no idea. Recruiters lie. If his mouth is moving, he's lying. So the issue is, of course, that this meaningful type of war machine is being used by the people. They go to uh, their own, they, they have their own version of this vehicle. That is another kind of projection vehicle. It's a propaganda vehicle. So, the, uh, so it's an interesting possibility of using this vehicle as a counter vehicle. Uh, so, um, just to show you a little bit how, how it works in the city. from some building, but Then, it was during the Democratic Convention. 
Because actually the situation of war veterans was not discussed by candidates for the president, even if one of them was war veteran. and we've had the beginning of this uh, conversation before, is that a few times during the presentation you referred to the, to the act of designing, the role of the designer, who was designer, industrial design. And I think um, the whole conversation around the question of instruments and instrumentality and the relation between art and design, it's an interesting one because um, on the one hand you're dealing with the design of certain instruments. On the other hand, you're dealing really with the idea of uh, the voice of the citizens themselves. Uh, but the voice, the, the voice that is given to the citizens, I mean, it is actually for the purpose also of the construction of the art project in some ways. So, so there, there is a, there's sort of, there's a, there's a time of thinking that is given to the project, but the participation of those people is also of a limited period. Then there is the performance itself of the artwork, which is the projection that is taking place. Um, so I think just because I know that with your own background as a as both an artist and somebody who's done design, I think it would be helpful if you could expand a little bit on how you see certain differences or, or similarities or blurring the boundaries between how you see this as art. Is this something that is uh, kind of socially engaged design project? The degree to which this is also now a new kind of space in the city. I mean, I, I, I think we, we could probably touch on all of those things, but I think some level of clarification from how you are, how you, how you think you are situating yourself in relation to the disciplines, in relation to the city in relation to the, to the city uh, would, be, would be helpful, even though you've kind of explained that in, you know, in the last 40 minutes or so. But I think to hear something a little bit more from you on that would be, would be a good way of maybe opening it up to everybody. But you know, historically, artists, at least in a few significant occasions, they became designers. It, it seems they in the moment when they thought that their job is to um, to transform the world and do it with people. It, it happened before. Uh, we're talking about constructivist period, uh, productivism, in fact. It was all moved into design, into production, in fact. That was the design. So, um, then the opposite is also true. You know, lots of designers move with projects that uh, that op became more of a works of art in, 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 a, in that sense that they use certain autonomy as inspiring uh, propositions that uh, twist and change, inspire imagination, and perception of the world, even if they were not built. So I think that we are kind of uh, always in a potential 
position to, to switch our role or work together. That is also true. So I'm not, uh, but how, how I see it, it's difficult, it's diffi difficult to explain without actually showing each project that I've done. It's very hard to summarize it and say, all right, that's my uh, idea of artists and what design is. But this interrogative design thing, I try to uh, explain. No, but, but just because, maybe, because maybe I can it, it has a deconstructive aspect and constructive at the same time. So it's, it's something that is undoing something that is revealing what other people what is not being seen and understood. At the same time, it's uh, uh, proposing something has to be rejected very often as impossible solution. Uh, uh, so in a scandalous world, the design has to be a scandal because it responds to, to the needs that should not exist, yet do exist. So what do we do? Don't do anything because it's not make our hands dirty dealing with dirty issues, or uh, if, if, if you, we, need, we can do, uh, do those things at the same time, provide emergency service to help people to survive their situation, uh, at the same time articulate conditions that should not exist in hope that doing so will contribute to yet another situation in which this kind of project will be unnecessary, will be obsolete. So this is the utopia of this project. Utopia has been so on, utopia meaning uh, no place or so-called good place, uh, seen as the one that I refuse to accept in hope that doing so in public will, 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 will help that there will be a situation in which there will be no place for this place in the future. I mean, this is seem to be a utopia deconstructive constructive project. Here. Now, I think it can be called art, and it can be called design at the same time. Because all of that articulation, all of that uh, uh, finding a form that, uh, that is, that is seem to be strangely familiar, because it refers to the world that we don't want to see, build all that world, yet it is actually uh, engaging those passive people into active speech and everybody else in discussing the matter through this project, there is a provoking this project, being converging point, provocative point. In that sense, it's definitely work of art. Because I don't know, I don't know anything else to create such effect. <laughs> so in the negative sense, I cannot imagine anything else that can be done that intervention, twisting our imagination and mind and provoke a different kind of discourse. But maybe uh, uh, I'm too much... That's what it is. They don't, they don't necessarily want to use it to create a kind of transformation. Unfortunately, so, there are people. Like so that, that which is fine. Yeah, that's great. And it's also clear that you, you, know, you have a very strong political uh, engagement with the work where the the phenomenon of, of instrumentality is a given condition of your, your work. So the question is not whether there is or there isn't, because that work you know, is very clear what you're doing. It's really a question of the limits of, of that instrumentality. And where, what are the aspirations for that instrumentality? And, and uh, so maybe, for example, in the photo, in, in uh, the, the San Diego, on a uh, order and you're dealing with the concept of the monument, that monument also has a relevance to you because it does have this kind of utopian uh, logic to it, with its shape and so on. So then you make you go and you make the city of refuge work. And at the city of refuge you also believe in the kind of complementarity of the city of refuge as a place for the citizens in, in parallel with the 9-11 monument. But even when you go there, you haven't seen the project, you also create a kind of utopian uh, proposal in the, in the shape of something that is 
has similar traditions, you know, to 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 Boule and Medu and this kind of situation. So I think the degree to which you are dealing with the, the projections and performance as as, as 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 a kind of instrumental device, which is also a rhetorical device for communication, and then you deal with a propositional device, of literally now making the monument. In the, in, and, and saying that that monument now is the place through which the, the citizens speak, then I think I have a certain kind of questions about the, the, the kind of consistency of argument from the instrumentality of the monument to the, to the proposal of the monument as a kind of maybe or delay um, in terms of its wholeness. So I think it's, I'm asking the question, about that that moment of shift from from the, the, the rhetorical to a kind of actualization of the monumental as a as a sort of, uh, of you know as a sort of new and alternative utopia. So next to this yeah. point, you want to look away that will first of all stress that the, the instrumental projects as we call them uh, are obviously temporary. Why uh, the monument design here is uh, wants to belong to permanent or I'm not against permanent as long as it changes, as long as it responds, as long as uh, creates conditions for change. So that, that it is seem to be contradictory, but in fact. The issue is whether I've done a good job so, uh, so jumping from one field to another. Probably not, because I have serious doubts myself about this project. But the, the, the intention is to actually create equipment, another kind of instrument, a permanent instrument, but that will really continuously engage people in debate and exchange and uh, have provocative and agonistic kind of memory transformative work, and also educational work, as we learn from uh, the, uh, what is written in the Bible. I mean, uh, uh, just referring to what one of those Moses is designed, uh, proposed as city of refuge, in which was the city of learning, the city of transforming the situation. Uh, so it's kind of uh, uh, transformative justice, or uh, uh, unity justice. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, it's, it's about the monument that does something, rather than petrifies the whole issue, covers it up, or a form, solid form. These, but of course, ironically, here it assumes the form of a monument. I mean, there's a problem here, but I, I can get out of this kind of uh, 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 trap, you know, to which I put myself. Because in fact, perhaps this, uh, city of it should not have a form. It should not be centrally located. Maybe it should be everywhere. It should have a kind of nomadic form. Mm -hmm. I actually asked this myself in this case. Mm -hmm. But perhaps, unfortunately, I said that, uh, that it may be good if it's centrally located in, in, in New York City Harbor, because it actually, uh, as an icon, it, it helps with its own operation. Maybe I'm wrong. But I'm not going to, uh, uh, to to step back and say no longer permanent project. In fact, um, responsive project will be always on my mind. Uh, they bring life to money. And, uh, as a parallel, simultaneously, as well as life in my life. Well, um, oh, the game is this. The event, which was, of course, not quite as informal as advertised. Uh, I was um, very struck by a word that you used uh, that's so rarely used today, and which struck me extremely powerful. That was the, the, the word virtuosity. You said these things give and they, they endow the user with a kind of virtuosity. Um, remind myself that that term really comes from music. And it's sort of where you come from, too. 
That's what I commented. Yeah. Um, and another kind of related thing on that front is the evocation uh, breath that made me begin to completely think about your work in a different kind of way as theater. And I was just wondering how, if you could expand on or just somehow comment on the performative aspect uh, you know, of the work and the concept of virtuosity, which you know, in a way has to do, it seems, also with the capacity to communicate, the virtuosity, but also the capacity to deploy the techniques of our society, our culture, uh, of communication, etc., whether it be through projection, through just in some ways uh, you know, taking command of the apparatus of communication, speech, and so on. Virtuosity. Can I have to bring it back on that? Because I'd actually written exactly this this word of virtuosity. And just I think it's exactly very much in agreement with what you're saying, but it also seems like the people, like the Japanese schoolgirls, is there is there my question is sort of a little bit more more practical. Like are there rules of engagement where this system of communication also uh, pushes towards a kind of different methodology of engagement. So for example, the people in Tijuana, Tijuana, we want them to also engage politically in a different way. So so the question of virtuosity is like, how do you become, I mean, with the first one, with the noise and the, and the movement of the choreography of the body was very explicit because it didn't involve an utterance. It involved the body movement and through the body you control the sound. But with the other ones, somebody has got to speak. And so, you know, enabling speech and pushing it to the next level of virtuosity are slightly two different things. So, I mean, if I can just think about it. And while you're thinking, virtuosity. <laughs> Pure virtuosity. <we're> <laughs> I guess virtuosity uh, has something to do with uh, developing abilities, skills that go beyond somebody's initial imagination. So one can surprise oneself is what one can do. It's a kind of Nietzsche thing. You actually, we don't know what we can do. So by creating experimental development. So it, it, it's virtuosity in, in the case of people who are incapacitated, unheard, invisible, and they, are, you know, they lost even confidence that their voice may make any difference. Mm -hmm. the, 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 it's an incredible thing. It, the, it requires virtuosity. It's their virtuosity to actually uh, re um, undo the damage, in fact, uh, unfreeze the freezing failure situation in which they are speaking like very clinical. It's a, you have to unfreeze. So you are, you, in a, it is, has to be done through a series of attempts, uh, even failures, and trying and, and leaving and coming back. That has to really get into this developmental process. The virtuosity is impossible without training, without uh, you know, developing skills. So in this is a very political issue and uh, also psychological issue, even when it comes to uh, people who will be uh, who are operators and co-artists in those projects. Also, the, po the point is that in the process of them learning and discussing what they should say and why are they doing this, uh, the question whether it's their work or my work should not be uh, formulated, should not even come out. <laughs> because if it is if it works well, it's their success. If it fails, it's my fault. Really. So it has to be their success in this in this process. Uh, now this is a very social definition of your trust. But uh, I could of course take a more phenomenological approach as well say that, uh, first of all, those people uh, have incredible talents and capacities of which we don't know. They might suddenly become uh, fantastic poets in formulating what they say and writing it down. They, they have hidden talents there. 
Uh, but also, their bodily speaking, if they become the monuments, or become cyborgs, <coughs> they become new kind of bodies. It's also a very, a very special experience for them. So here, the facade, the prestigious building, uh, they, they become uh, a major body right, in the city. So they, they, they turn themselves into witnesses and powerful speakers uh, in the city landscape. Or they, or they are there on television, presented as those uh, uh, cyborgs because very often this project is uh, being simulated by media, uh, with the performance, instrumental projects. So I don't know if this is of any uh, response to this, but uh, media, media lab, it's absolutely clear that virtuosity is part of the agenda as well, in terms of instrumental research, to create conditions that we learn more about ourselves through wearing or operating equipment is there. That potential is always there. But I don't want this to be disconnected from the social and ethical political project. Because often that's what it happens. So this kind of enthusiasm about some of those instruments without, uh, without that social and political and ethical dimension. I think all of this together can be developed, rather than one against another. Um, could you expand on the question of embodiment? Some of these projects are primarily turning people into cyborgs, um, using their body in the space to create their presence. And in some, their bodies may produce the information like the speech, but you're simply presenting as spectacle the text of their speech, um, either in sound or in, um, in textual font information. And I'm wondering if that's something where you've made a decision that, for instance, the veteran stories will be seen taken away from their faces and their physical presence that would give them a, us a great deal of information about who these people are versus the ones in Tijuana where we don't have text per se, um, perhaps because of issues of literacy. And I'm wondering if you can talk about those decision processes um, that you make in these different interventions. This uh, in Tijuana, the very act of showing one's face, it's extremely serious risk. It's a decision that requires an enormous amount of consultation among his family, his friends. Is it uh, more risky to show your face and speak, and being seen by everybody, or uh, being silent? person who put her husband to prison for incest uh, was uh, part of that project. And uh, she did, her husband was about to come out from prison. Right? So she said, he's going to try to kill me. So is it safer to be exposed like this or to be in hiding? She decided it's safer to speak. Some people decide the opposite. And it's not for everybody for those who are ready to make a leap in their own world. Uh, this is not uh, a cure, it's not like a medical equipment, it's just a cultural project that helps people to advance you know, their, own, their own process of reintegration with society or, or dealing with a post-traumatic uh, or some other social ills. So um, that's one case. Uh, with the veterans, I think that the words, and first of all, the sounds seem to be very, very important because uh, they uh, themselves say that they have a lot of uh, smell I cannot project, but it would actually be a very good idea because their post traumatic uh, life with their memories is very much mediated, triggered by smells and sounds. That, that's 
most of the stomach stress uh, uh, survivors. Um, so to show also to actually acoustically uh, animate the city is appropriate uh, when it comes to uh, returning soldiers. It's an urban warfare, you know, that uh, has uh, all to do with sounds and echoes and reflections and uh, the inscription of those of, the, of those memories into the, the facades acoustically and visually can be done best this way, I thought. So in a way, I, my decisions are also what works best. You know, even if I would like maybe to do it differently, but there is a facade is waiting for some troubles to happen. Or there is this Humvee vehicle, <laughs> which is the icon of the war. It used to be a helmet. Now it's a vehicle. So it, just to understand that this is part of the project uh, as a kind of mobile military unit that speaks, all of this uh, informs the direction of development of the project. Even if I may, maybe I would have liked to do differently, but I have taken into account. It's a tactical thing. You take what is there and try to use it, you know, as it goes, do the best you can. I mean, the, the project with veterans can be done also with showing their faces, with their bodily engagement in another, on another occasion. So I'm not excluding it. Thank you. Um, I am interested in the third world cities, and especially Latin American cities. And as, as you know very well, there are now a big debate on the question of the two souls of the city, the Baroque soul and the enlightened soul of the city. And my, my question is, to which extent would you consider yourself a Baroque artist? Baroque, absolutely. A Baroque artist. Because, I mean, you are using exactly the same device. You are using technology to connect cities uh, and the people. Absolutely Baroque. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, but one thing is that immigrants, as Chris Teva said, are Baroque personalities. Oh, those who are strange, they try to communicate. They have to use very complex, kind of, non-linear disruptive narrative against grand kind of linear national or other narrative. So there's always this kind of performative aspect uh, that strangers and, and others, they have no choice, they have to seek those resources. In that sense, they're all Baroque. Well, you know, it, and they have all those the illegal immigrants working in cleaning offices. If you meet them, they have no choice. They have to speak with everything they have against also sometimes lack of skills in particular language. But that some of them speak five, eight languages. So I'm saying that I learned Baroque art from people with whom I work. You spoke about the search or the making of democracy. I wonder if this um, only temporarily is a performance, or is there also a spatial aspect of this, of forming democracy? I mean, Hannah Arendt mentioned her, she was speaking in the Arena. I'm just thinking of... About visibility. She, she, I mean, yeah. in relation to Agora, I assume that you're referring to that said that uh, um, equality and visibility goes hand in hand. So invisibility, inequality also go hand in hand. Uh, it's true. Uh, inscription of one's presence in uh, permanent symbolic forms, an environment that is there, uh, uh, it represents this history of victors and keeps forgetting about those who didn't succeed. <laughs> Just the projecting it, animating it, it also helps to transmit the memory, the presence of those people through generations. At least, Arwen is a certain amount of time. So the temporary project actually can uh, become quite a long-term project as a kind of after image that's uh, the effect that stays there. Sometimes more than permanent forms that just simply vanish as decoration. talk a little bit about the artifact itself that you're producing 
um, the, the use of technology today seems to tend towards an invisible or wireless or kind mm -hmm. of, um, you know, something like that, but you're producing something very different. Can you talk about that? In the book, you know, each project is, is different. I, I didn't have a chance to show many things selected on the several. But uh, the one that I showed to Ivana, the uh, the design of the project, is, uh, was inspired by the techno culture. It was a time of a very popular uh, humanoid uh, kind of uh, toys. Uh, they were called Gunda series. So I took this series. They, in fact, Hiroshima was the, the major uh, armor produ producer from uh, the ancient time to uh, the last several wars. And also the children very much into those uh, armed creatures uh, with mechanical capacities. So uh, this, is, this was a reference. In fact, also to samurai uh, armor. The samurai armor, the samurai manufacturer samurai armor was very much in Hiroshima. And there is a whole museum about it. So that, 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 that's fantastic. And that are humanoids are referring to that the Japanese humanoids are kind of samurai mm -hmm. creatures, contemporary. Was, uh, so the, the combining of digital uh, and, uh, aspect and uh, basic communication equipment with forms of this sort uh, seem to be uh, appropriate, especially working with high school students. And in fact, uh, it was a result of some discussions with them that this direction was taken. Uh, but it's, it's important that uh, the playfulness of this kind of uh, equipment is, is crucial because the seriousness of the situation is symptomatic. To create uh, conditions for humor and uh, an outburst of laughter, it's like uh, Benjamin said about breath, it's a, 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 a vibration of a diaphragm provides better conditions for start of thinking than vibration of the soul. And the vibration of the soul is there all the time in Japan. It's the most serious country in the world. And sense it deeply into the melancholy. So to actually activate, to disrupt, that's why the laughter in this classroom was very crucial. This person was being rejected by everybody because supposedly he had a different texture of his skin. I could not see any difference, uninformed. But he was being expelled by everybody. This is a standard thing in Japan. You have to be standard, otherwise you're out. So you know, here he is wearing this new skin. I mean, there are various things behind each of those projects. That not everybody uses those projects. So there's a kind of natural process of connection. I didn't want to talk too long about Can you also talk a little bit about like, the, the role of technology? Because very often we see technology as kind of instrumentalizing us or we are basically functioning after the technology. But here the technology is also a form of empowerment. And like if somebody stands on the screen and says something, very often they get stopped or they are not heard, etc. Yeah. But with such a device, you suddenly have a very strong empowerment. Well, that's inspiring uh, all kind of classic text by Don Harry. Cyborg is not simply a mixture of artificial and natural. But it's actually a possibility for somebody to uh, smoothly cross the boundary between the, what's natural and what's artificial. So the control of it is important. If you, if they, it doesn't mean that I don't know this. I'm saying I'm a horizon in front of my work. Was maybe didn't reach it, but it is to create conditions for someone to close the shields and open. So they have a control over set, putting armor on and disarming oneself. Well, this armor. It's like, first you recognize the armor. So it is already artificial of you. You are a kind of artificial to yourself. Okay? And so it's an uncanny thing to actually recognize it and open it up. So uh, the technology, uh, the te technique here, has to be understood also as skillful process of uh, 
of finding a right occasion for making a scandal or the right kind of form right, to employ in this or that intervention. So the technology probably is too understood too much as a, as a technical thing rather than as media thing or as a bodily thing, as a kind of uh, uh, instrumental in a, in a phenomenological way, as something that is connected with body. Uh, you're right, that this question is being asked. Is this, uh, for example, what I do, stigmatizing people or uh, making them more like enslaved you know, as operator of the of equipment? Or is this, as you say, empowering? Or creating playful situation in which they can actually uh, reveal seemingly contradictory aspects, the artificial and natural, inside of themselves? When it comes to immigrants, they are both natural and artificial because they are between lost land and promised land, between the language that is their mother tongue and the new, they are, they are, they are, they are really in, in, in the process of becoming and also the process of, uh, of, of losing one, oneself. It's a, it's a constant journey. So the other equipment that I present, we have to show here, was also kind of equipment that help those people to, to move through this journey with some technological uh, components. But if you simply look at this thing in itself, of course it's, it's kind of machine or equipment. If you see it as a part of a social performance, uh, then uh, maybe the, te the word technology has, has to be redefined. Maybe we have to redefine this word uh, in, in case of this, because I like the word. Some people are afraid of it. To make it devil out of it. But I'm industrial designer, so I, I, this is the start, starting point in my entire life is to work in industry with technology. So maybe, maybe yours could be our last. Did you ever wonder about some of the, uh, the principles that you put forward as, that sounded very certain underlying um, the process in your work, um, like the idea that visibility and equality go hand in hand, um, or the idea that um, to give speech is to empower? as opposed to um, sort of questions about whether to um, to identify a particular group as victim group is already to assume that Yeah, I, I question this. Um, but but, but um, I'll give you an example of somebody's work that I like very much. She designed, she's like an architect actually, uh, she designed uh, a double ceiling and kind of hiding places for immigrants. Uh, yeah, we were in contact. It's, I really like this. But, you mean to make the vis visible the, the fact that one has to hide. <laughs> it's, a, it's a double kind of uh, like very much kind of design. So of course, are they really protected by this, or this is just revealing the fact that they need protection? Or, 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 or can those things work together, maybe both at the same time in certain circumstances? In other circumstances, they will just display of the issue in museums. Maybe that, that there is a possibility to provide. In that way, the project is similar to my uh, other pro my projects, but uh, the, the trick is more interesting. I found it more interesting <laughs> because the secrecy and hiding is also part of life of those people. And there is no politics without secrecy. That's one of the basic components of politics. So you have to hide something in order to, to make a change. So there may be holding, uh, at one point, people should jump in the project that I propose, and another time they should jump in the project of, uh, of this uh, designer. Or maybe there's some other type of project that are based completely on putting people to create alternative and secret uh, society. Uh, but I won't tell you. <laughs> <laughs>
That was a good idea. Thank you so much.